so hi everyone and um, so thank you for coming to this webinar um, I'm, I'm very happy to to welcome today uh, Thomas de Garay so Thomas uh, studied biochemistry and molecular biology at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and then he got a PhD in Nice at Sofia Antipolis in um, cellular molecular biology and before joining Refine in Oxford uh, at the beginning of this year, where now he's a field application scientist. So, Thomas, thank you again for coming, and uh, the screen is yours. Well, for how, oh, that's okay. <laughs> I thought that was myself. <laughs> thank you very much for, for inviting us, uh, for having us here today. Um, that's, that's great that we can do these things now very fast uh, and, and remote. We don't need to organize too many travels and trips. So, yeah, as, as he said, I'm working now for Refine after uh, living in France for quite some, some years. Now I'm in Oxford. Um, and uh, I'm field application specialist, so I will give you an overview today of the technology that we that was developed here in Oxford and that we uh, commercialized and developed. So I first have a few uh, slides and a part of the talk about the technology itself, how what it is exactly, what we are measuring, and what it means. And then I have a, a few examples on on data on real data, either internal data from us or from customers that are already using the instrument. A few papers that are published, so that you can see what it looks like in real life and what how can relate to the different types of of samples that um, that you can have or that can be interesting. Uh, and then, so yeah, I think we it might be easier because we are quite a lot if we leave the questions uh, for the end, but. Please uh, write them down or make sure to ask. There will be plenty of time at the end for questions. It's a rather short presentation. So the idea is mostly to discuss what could be interesting for you rather than me giving a million examples of things that might not be relevant. Um, so yeah, let me let me get started here. This, as we, as we say here, this, this, what we do is called uh, mass photometry. That's the name of the technology. And we say we wait molecules with light and as you will see it's it's pretty much that it is it, rather like simple as that as it sounds so i will give you an introduction now first to who we are and how we we do this uh, waiting molecules with light now on the who we are uh just just one little comment about the company itself as i said we are spun out from oxford university from the chemistry department that's where the headquarters of the of the company is, and we have another office in the in the U.S. to cover America. And by now, we have about uh, fifty systems, even a little bit more than fifty worldwide. You can see there are a few blue spots uh, scattered all over the globe. So, so Matt, can you uh, put your presentation in full screen, please? Oh, it's not in full screen. Uh... I can see your, uh... PowerPoint or whatever uh, software. So let's try to redo this. What am I sharing? Okay, let me. Huh. No matter how many tests you do, there will always be something. <laughs> Is that big yeah. now? Yeah, okay. Fine. Thank you. Great. Yeah, let me know if it stops being big at one point because it's like um okay yeah so as i was saying uh oh there we're back we are in oxford um we are a team of about 30 people 35 by now more we are we're still hiring so if even through the pandemic we kept hiring people if somebody uh feels like this is a good place to be and would be interested, please contact us because we are interested in good scientists as well. Um, and uh, our aim is mostly to spread and make this technology available to the research community worldwide because we think it's a very powerful tool. So as I said, uh, we wave molecules with light and it's this is the very simplified principle. It, you will see the physics later and it's slightly more complex, but the, the idea is as simple as, as what you can see here. The molecules interact with the light and they scatter light in particular to a certain extent. And this, this extent is proportional to their mass. So the idea says that if you could detect that light, 
then you could um, weight the particle itself. You could get the mass of this particle. And this is exactly what we do. We do this by an implementation of uh, measuring the interference of two different waves. So this is, the idea is not something new. It's something that's been around for many years. There are many implementations of interference microscopy, interferometric microscopy, with reflection, with scattering, with different um, uh, types of, of implementations. But it has been used until now to image thing, bigger things, things like cells, organelles, um, and things like this. Uh, but what they, the idea that they got here in Oxford in the university was that if you just go down to the theory, if you could do the experiment perfectly, you could see anything, no matter how small, even down to the way of single molecules, which is very far from a cell. But, um, but it, it was in theory possible. And the limitation for that with all the implementations that was, were done until now and were available was the signal to noise ratio. The signal to noise ratio for the amount of signal that a single molecule um, scatters, the amount of light that a single molecule scatters needed to be improved by several orders of magnitude to be detectable. That's where the real challenge came. This take uh, quite some years, uh, about a decade of optimization that was done at the university here by a couple of groups. But eventually through many different uh, strategies that are nowadays implemented in the commercial instrument, uh, together with some extra development that we did in the company, we did manage to get the background stable enough and the signal to noise ratio high enough that we could detect not only a cell, but also a single protein or a DNA, small DNA molecule or smaller things like this. So let me walk you through how it works and what we do. This is, this is probably the, the key slide to understand the technology. Um, so what we have here on the top um, panel, it's essentially a, a slide of glass that is the, the gray line that we have here at the bottom. This is a, a standard cover slip for, for microscopy, the ones that are used for microscopy. And on top of this cover slip, we do put a drop of buffer of aqueous solution with the molecules of interest. That's what it would be um, in the upper part. Now the molecules of interest are in solution in native conditions, they don't need to be modified at all. And the idea is that we shine light at this surface of glass. That will be the incident light here. And we recover, so we have a, a microscopy setting. If you look at it and you're familiar with microscopy, it looks a lot like a microscope. So there is an objective below and this incident light that is, that is shined through the objective, then it's partially recovered down through the objective again. So we recover whatever is perpendicular to the glass surface. On one hand, we recover the light that is reflected. That is the one here. It's recovered and it's only a partial part of the light that was incident. And this is homogeneous all over the glass surface. We recover this light all over and we get that as background. And then we recover as well the scattered light from the proteins. So the moment that the proteins get close enough to the, to the glass water interface, like here, that they interact, then the proteins adsorb to the glass surface and they scatter light from the proteins. Um, they will scatter light in all directions, including the direction perpendicular to the glass. So we recover this wave as well. Now these two waves, the scattered and the reflected, because they are slightly out of phase, they interact destructively. This means in a way, if you will, they are subtracted from each other. So then what we recover and what you see on the screen when you use the instrument is an image. That's what you can see in the, in the middle uh, panel with a, with a CMOS camera. And this, this is a real time image. So it's a video. And what you will see is an more or less homogeneous background where there are no particles. That is the light reflected from the glass. And whenever a particle entered in contact with the glass because of this interference between the scattered and the reflected light, you will see a spot that looks something like this one here. 
This is the point spread signal uh, function of the of the light scattered by the by this particle, and essentially means that the intensity of the signal, if we can measure it, is proportional to the mass of the particle. So the darkness of the center of the spot, that's what we quantify in the end, is proportional to the mass of the particle. So here you can see that, that you have this one that I just circled that is slightly darker as opposed to this other here that is slightly dimmer. Then what we do is we record a minute of this movie of particles binding to the glass and the software goes through this video and it quantifies the intensity of each of the of the spots that would be each spot would be one particle and then it, it generates a histogram so it plots number of counts in the y-axis versus the contrast so the intensity of that signal in the x-axis and that's what you can see at the bottom panel and that is the final out output of the um, measurement so in this example you can see we have three different populations one of particles that are uh, smaller here, then some particles with a, a mid size, and finally uh, big particles somehow. And you can see these three populations that are separated, and you can even quantify the relative distribution of each of them because what you have in the y axis is the number of events, so the number of single molecules that belong to each of these populations. This is, the, this is the final output of the of the measurement. Now, as I said, the beauty of, of this technology is that this contrast, so the intensity of the spots in the image in the middle, that's what we primarily measure, is directly proportional to the mass of the particle. So you can just transform this contrast into mass by applying a, a calibration, a, a, reg a linear regression, like in many other technologies, we measure a set of standard samples that we know the mass of we tell the software the masses of those particles it plots it versus the contrast that was acquired in the in the measurement and then you can interpolate the masses of particles of interest and what we see in practice uh, is that that relationship holds very well so if you look at the um, uh, expected mass versus the mass that we measure in practice with mass photometry for proteins. It is this graph in this example is for proteins. And by now we have many, many points in this line that we've measured. You can see there is a very good linear relationship and the error it's uh, about 5% maximum. So this is how it, uh, how it looks in theory. And, and this, this graph is how you can um, exemplify the measurement and make a, a little bit of a cartoon of it. But now let me show you a bit what it looks in practice, just so you get a, a rough idea of what the instrument looks like and how the operation looks. So this is a, a video now that should show you in, in a minute what we have. Now that is the instrument, and that is uh, my colleague pipetting a sample onto the instrument. You can see the objective below, so it looks a lot like a microscope, and that is a solution of proteins. Now, as soon as you close the lid, that was 10 microliters of proteins, you can already see on the screen the events happening. Each of these spots is one uh, particle landing on the glass at one moment in time. We record, as I said, over a minute. And then when you go to the analysis software, you will see that the, the software now goes through the video and it will identify each of those spots, each of those events and it will quantify the signal on those. And once it's done, it generates a histogram like the one you can, you can see here. And now by applying a calibration, as I mentioned before, then you can transform the contrast into mass. And we normally fit a Gaussian because the populations follow a normal distribution and can see the, the size of each of the, of the populations and the amount of molecules that was in there. So that's, that's to give you a little teaser of how the reality looks like, which is always nice to, to see rather than just imagining things in, in your head. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so I think by, by all these characteristics that I just explained about the technology, you can imagine um, a bit of the 
the benefits of the technology and how it can complement other uh, technologies that you probably have in your facilities and in your labs and what use cases could be beneficial for this. We have a, a mass measurement of molecules that are in solution and are in two native conditions. So there is no need for a modification, it's label free. And uh, you can see the samples as they are in your buffer of choice. We see the, the particles at single molecule. So that gives access to subpopulations within the same sample. It's not an ensemble measurement. It's not uh, an average of, of something. It's really single molecule. So you can see if you have different uh, species in the, in the same sample at the same time or different distribution of the species. And the mass range that, that we have is quite wide. We can go from 40 kilodaltons to five megadaltons. So you can imagine from single proteins to big complexes or even DNA molecules, uh, protein DNA complexes, other things like this. Even the small viruses like AAVs we can see as well. So you can imagine seeing this, using it for uh, homogeneity assay, sample uh, quality checks, purification quality checks, structural integrity of the samples, binding protein, protein binding uh, assays, so protein DNA binding assays, uh, all the things like this. It's, it's one format, but it gives you many different outputs depending on what your question is. Uh, and in terms of a couple of um, practical numbers that, that you can have in mind, as I said, the measurement takes one minute itself, plus maybe one extra minute of analysis. So that's a, a fast measurement. The operation is rather simple, as, you, as you've seen in the video. And the amount of samples that we're using are from 10 to 20 microliters of a 100 nanomolar to 100 picomolar concentration. So it's very low concentrations, which means we use up very little of the sample and you can keep the, the rest for whatever extra assays you, you want to do downstream. That's a bit of the streamline of all the characteristics that, that we have here. Uh, so I will now switch gears a little bit and tell you all these things I mentioned, homogeneity, structural assays, binding assays, what do they look like? What exactly can we do with this? So I will show you a few examples of actual data taken with the instrument that is commercially available in different systems. And I hope this can relate to your, um, to your different samples. Um, as I say, I will talk a little bit about each of them. And maybe at the end, if you are interested in, in one system in particular, just raise your hand and we can discuss a little bit longer about that. But I don't want to dwell too much in things that are not maybe not relevant to you. So just a very um, simple, let's say, to start with just one protein monodispersed. This is an antibody. Uh, that's how it looks like in, in mass photometry. This is a one minute measurement of one antibody. We can see that there is one uh, peak at 150 kilodaltons, and that is the main peak. So that would be the monomer of the antibody population. There is a bit of a dimer at 300, and this, this antibody was known to form dimers in some conditions. And there is even some uh, particles of the trimer size, although it's very little. So that, that's how it looks like when the protein is monodispersed and homogeneous. Of course, if the sample gets a little bit heterogeneous in itself, then the peaks will widen and the resolution will be affected. And that depends on the nature of the sample. Now, I will be talking mostly about so far, but that's not the only thing we can do. We can also see other biomolecules. We can basically see any biomolecule that is in the size range. So. DNA, RNA, nucleic acids are also a big, a big uh, field of application. And this is how it looks now for, for a DNA measurement. On the left, what you can see is a DNA ladder, the ones that are used for agarose electrophoresis or that everybody has in the lab. This is how we can, how we can see it. So we can see all the bands. Uh, I think this is 100 base pairs, 200 base pairs, 400, 800, uh, 1 kb. And you can see that they follow a linear relationship as well, the same as they do for proteins. And in this case, it's instead of kilodaltons versus contrast, it's base pairs versus contrast, but it's another measurement of mass. And then you can apply this to, to see PCR products, to see plasmids or other DNA molecules. 
And so that was on the small end of things, rather, 150 kilodaltons, a PCR of 300 base pairs. On the big side, we can see, as I said, up to five megadaltons. And uh, this is one of the biggest particles we can see. This is AV5, so it's uh, adeno-associated viruses, which are very much used now uh, for gene therapy development. And there is a very big question in the field on whether the um, uh, industrial processes to develop these therapies result in what is the percentage of success in uh, loading the viruses, the viral the vectors with DNA particles, with the, the genome that needs to be delivered to the cells. So that's what we can see here. It's two populations of empty versus loaded adeno-associated viruses. And you can see now how the peaks are wider because the molecules are more heterogeneous, but they are separated enough and we can very much differentiate both of them. So this is how a sample can look in the bigger end of things. This you could have again for big protein complexes or, or things like this. Now, this is as far as uh, samples themselves go, but now going into a little bit more of uh, structural biology and processes that can happen, you can imagine comparing different, different circumstances and uh, checking different processes that are known to be biologically relevant. Like that's, that's what happens in this case, right? This is a, a grow yield, this is the chaperone of E. coli. And um, it's known to oligomerize and for this 14 mer uh, in the presence of ATP, but that is not the case in the absence of ATP. And that's what you can see on the right, on the graphs, right? The top panel is in the absence of ATP. We can see the monomer and the dimer, even a bit of the trimer. And then on the bottom panel, it's the presence of ATP. So you can see the 14 mer that is formed. This was, was known that this, this 14 mer was formed, but people were very much interested in the profile of this because of course it's never perfect. It's never fully 14 mer. There is still some portion of monomer, but there is a whole lot of intermediate species. Uh, so in this case, they were interested in the, in the orange region in the middle to see this intermediate species also. How are they? The, the monomer, the, the dimer, how many of those are there? And the 14 mer, how many of those are there? And how does this equilibrium change in different conditions? So that's something you can, you can see here comparing different regions. And something similar we can do again in, in bigger, uh, stuff like uh, ribosomes, for instance. Uh, so ribosome assembly is something we can see, uh, we can see very well. This is the E. coli ribosome, so the prokaryotic ribosome. And you can see how in the, in the presence of magnesium, we get the 30S and the 50S, so the two subunits, but also the 70S, that's the one on the, on the very right, the full ribosome formed complex. Uh, whereas in the absence of magnesium, because magnesium is needed for the, the formation of this, then there is the, the 70S is completely gone. The, the 30s and the 50s are still there, but the other one is not there. And you can evaluate this formation in, in different conditions. Um, now going a little bit deeper into structural biology, um, as I was saying, there are many samples you could, you could apply this to. But in the end, of course, you would probably like to bring the samples downstream to a more purely structural biology procedure uh, in, a, in a more powerful way, like crystallization or cryo-EM or something like that. And we've seen a lot lately of take up of the technology in these processes as an upstream control to make smart decisions on what samples are worth continuing to work downstream in these more complex, time-consuming and resource-intense procedures that have in structural biology and which samples to abandon before. And there is actually a paper published uh, about this. I have, I put the reference here below. So I will, I will, well, I've been told this presentation is being recorded and I can probably share, share the slides as well later. So if you're interested in some of the um, um, references, you can always uh, check them there. But here they do a, a, a very standard study on how cryo EM compares to mass photometry and how the profiles in mass photometry compare to the actual different uh, molecules that they see in negative staining. So they took the proteasome as an, as an example. So if you, if you are interested in the proteasome in particular, this is a very interesting paper. 
they check different purification methods and different purification fractions of the proteasome. They check them by mass photometry. So they get different profiles uh, that correspond to different expected molecules judged by the size of them uh, that are that those fractions are enriched in. And then they bring this, these fractions to negative staining and they evaluate what molecules do they see more often in the, in the actual uh, photos of negative staining in the pictures. And they see there is a very good correlation. And actually now they are using mass photometry as, as a fast check that doesn't consume pretty much anything of the sample to decide if the sample is homogeneous enough and it's in the state that it's required to bring down to mm, cryo EM downstream or whether they need a, another prep or which prep to choose or which fraction to choose. Mm. So now I've been talking about mostly uh, quality check, checking the samples to see what is worth working with in the future, but you can also use mass photometry as, a, as an analytical tool in, in itself to check different um, factors that can be related to the function of the protein. Uh, because most, most of them can be related to different, um, conformations or structural states of different proteins. That is the case here, for instance, for, uh, FOXP2. FOXP2 is a transcription factor and it's known to oligomerize. And this oligomerization state, uh, they suspected the authors here in this paper. This is also uh, published that the um, oligomerization state was related to the functionality of the protein and the, the binding of the protein to DNA downstream. And they wanted to check exactly which domains or, or functional motifs in the structure of the protein were important or what role were they playing in that process. So what they did was to take the full structure of FOXP2 and they um, either deleted or switched by alanine's uh, leucine zipper or a zinc fi finger. And they took these two constructs. So the one on the top is the wild type protein and the two in the bottom are the two uh, mutated constructs. And they evaluated the first the oligomerization state of the protein in each of the contrast of, of the um, mutants. And they could see that was different. But then also because it was taking so little of the protein, they could take exactly the same batch of protein in that state and bring it down to functional analysis, to DNA binding assays and to um, other types of functional assays. And they could see how exactly this oligomerization state was relating to functional uh, capacities of the protein. And they could put this, this data together in a very nice, to get a more complete picture of, of what was going on in there. So by now we have already a few publications on how to use mass photometry to evaluate protein-protein interactions. And you can even go all the way to quantify this, this protein, protein interactions. So I will show you a couple of examples now with, with antibodies, because this has been uh, characterized a little bit more. Just to get you an idea of what you can see. This is, this is a very good example. This is an, um, neutralizing antibody for HIV. So on the top panel, you can see the GP120. That is the antigen, uh, that, that it binds to. Then in the mid panel, you can see the antibody alone. So there is the, the antibody and it has a monomer and it has also a dimer to some extent of this antibody. And then at the bottom, that's the interesting one. There is the mix of both. And there here, you can see how you have the antigen alone that relates to the other peak of the antigen uh, when it was alone as the control. Then there is the antibody alone here that it's also relates to, to this one. And then you have the monomeric antibody antigen complex in dark blue. But you can also see the dimeric antibody here that relates to, to the one up. And then you can have the dimeric antibody antigen complex in dark blue as well. And you can see the relative distributions of all these populations. So this is an example of a little bit of a more complex profile with five different populations that can be differentiated. Now, this is very nice to see that it interacts uh, and, and more or less in what way it's interacting. But you can imagine if you titrate this to some in, in some way, you could even quantify these interactions. 
And now there are a couple of papers that came up this year about how to calculate KDs, the dissociation constants, from mass photometry data. Uh, this is this is one of them in which they were comparing it to ITC, BLI, and so a couple of technologies that are very well established in KD calculation and um, and uh, this sort of biophysics studies. And they compare the the things that they were uh, the numbers that they were getting with mass photometry as well to get very similar numbers. So here they were titrating the ligand to to a constant concentration of the antibody. This is again an antibody antigen interaction. And this is the other paper. They were published uh, very close to each other in which they got a slightly different approach. Here they went testing different concentrations of both the antibody and the, and the ligand. And in this case, it's an antibody receptor interaction. But in both ways, they, they describe very well how you can calculate different KDs of the process and what the limitations of the technology are, because of course, there are some, some limitations that are not the same as in BLI, ITC or other technologies. So it can be quite complementary depending on the system that you need to study. So there is the reference again are, are down there. And uh, we also have a webinar about this. We did a webinar discussing the results with the authors. If they are interested a little bit more in what they have to say about it, it's, it's on YouTube. Um, so now coming, coming to the end, um, I mentioned proteins, I mentioned DNA, and that we could have uh, also different kinds of biomolecules. So I just wanted to show one of the protein DNA complexes. So how, how would that look? And you can see it's pretty much very similar to the other graphs I showed before. You can distinguish all the molecules independently of their nature. This is a DNA molecule that you have on the, on the left. Uh, the, that's the DNA molecule alone. And on the right, this DNA molecule is being mixed with histones at a different ratio. So the, the length of the DNA molecule is constant, but the number of histones that are added to the mix is different. And you can see how in the first one, we detect a peak for what is corresponds to one nucleosome population and a higher peak for the population that would be forming two nucleosomes. Whereas if we increase the number of histones, the ratio of histones, then the equilibrium is shifting towards even having a population at three, um, his three nucleosome formation, nucleosomes formed. So you can evaluate all these um, different interactions independently of the nature of the molecules themselves. Now I mentioned we can see proteins that are up to 40 kilo down to 40 kilodaltons. So of course, small molecules are not visible in mass photometry. Any kind of small molecule activators, inhibitors, nucleotides, things like this, they will not show. But we can follow their effects if they affect the, the structure of the protein, uh, the mass of the protein to some extent. And you can even do that dynamically uh, by, by titrating different complexes. So that, that's what was done here. Here we have uh, a protein that forms, well, there's a tetramer and an octamer. Those are the two on the, at the top. And these are the functional units. But whenever some inhibitors are added to the mix, the inhibitors promote the formation of a 16-mer, that is the one at the bottom, and this 16-mer is inactive. And now by following the formation of the 16-mer peak at different concentrations of these inhibitor molecules, we got the curves that are on the, on the right. And we could compare actually the activity of two different inhibitor molecules, uh, the, the, one, the one here and here, versus a negative control, so a molecule that is a small molecule of the same nature that is not inhibiting this this factor. And they could see how the formation of this 16 mer and this this curve that we get here was very much relating to the functionality of the of the. Um, so the inhibition capacity of these molecules that they would see in other type of assays. And uh, just to finish, this is, this is the last example I have here. So to give you just a little bit of a teaser on dynamics, at what, what you can do if you play with time as well as, as um, part of the equation. So you can also imagine doing a, a, a sort of a time course or a dynamic analysis of the formation of some structure or the dissociation of some interaction, things like this. In this case, we have the formation of a cage, of a protein cage, and you can see it was measured from zero to 20 minutes, and you can see how the profile is shifting 
from the from the one megadalton uh, nucleating unit of the reaction towards the two megadalton uh, cage full cage formed. So you can do this kind of things following a reaction in time to get the shifting of the populations depending on the the time of the reaction, right? So those are those are the examples I I had for today. I tried to fit it a little bit to what uh, Julian mentioned was the main interests of of the audience, but of course, now I think the most interesting part is whether you have questions, let's focus on what's interesting for you, either in the, in the basis of the technology, if there's any question on, on how it works or what can be measured, or if you want to uh, discuss a little bit more about your particular use cases or the particular samples that you might want to, to see or to measure. Um, yeah, I think feel free to, I think you can unmute yourselves probably and, and we can uh, talk, right? Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for this uh, very clear and uh, nice presentation with many examples. Um, you can actually raise your hands if you have uh, questions uh, on the top, oh, Olivier. Okay, oh, yeah, I see it already. <laughs> uh, so I need to... Yes, Olivier. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Very nice talk. Very interesting. I have two questions. The first mm -hmm. one, is, um, it looks like that this technology is more appropriate for 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 middle or large um, uh, objects or proteins, and the, the, the smaller the proteins, the more error you have in in the appreciation of the mass. So, is it is it applicable to proteins like five, ten kD or things like this? This is my first question. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, you're correct. Um, the the instrument is specified. If you go to the so here I have all the numbers. This this slide will be as well in the in the stack, so you can get all the technical information. But the masses go from forty kilodaltons to five megadalton. Mm -hmm. So it's very wide in the big end. But yeah, I agree. For small proteins, it's not appropriate. Smaller than forty kilodaltons, we will not see them. So okay. if you have things like five kilodaltons, ten kilodaltons, those would be invisible to the to the technique. Of course, if you have complexes that are bigger, those you will see, but not the smaller ones. And I have a, a, a this is a very naive question for you and maybe for Julien as well. I'm, I'm not in the field, uh, but uh, how do you compare this to the technologies we have at IPBS in terms of uh, what, we, what it enables? We can't hear you. Yes, well, I. Olivier Julian, oh, yeah. the team aspect that we have uh, here at IPBS. Sorry. No, I was I was telling I was telling uh, Thomas that uh, you you were mentioning native mass spec. Yeah. 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 So I think it's it's very complementary. So I, I I won't say here it's better or worse than something else. It, it it's really a different thing. So it's it's probably better for some things, worse for some others. Uh, of course, if you want the most precise mass measurement, you would always go to mass, mass spec. That, that's the gold standard. And uh, you can see by the graphs, we are not that accurate. It will never be that. It's just a totally different concept, right? The, this takes a minute and it takes 10 micrometers of the sample and everybody can operate it. So I think it's a different use case. Uh, but if you want a, uh, a graph and a, a couple of numbers, then I can show you. Uh, the, I think you're still seeing the presentation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is how it compares in terms of what you can see for um, for um, for a protein. <coughs> Sorry. So this was alpha B crystalline. That's a, a polydispersed protein that forms from ten to fifteen mers, and it's been measured by by mass spec, native mass spec. Um, that's the one in dark blue. Mass photometry is the one in light blue. Um, and then it's electron microscopy and SEGMA. So you can, you can see a bit of, we are within the same redistribution of ranges and, and the accuracy, it's, uh, it's very comparable. Um, but of course, yeah, you can see we have an error of 5% in mass spec that, that's, well, depends on what you're doing mass spec on. There are many types, but that's totally different. So I think, yeah, we apply to, as you said, uh, prote from proteins, rather medium to big proteins to complexes. 
we uh, it's a, something fast, easy to use. It doesn't require modification, and it requires very small amount of your sample. However, we compromise on resolution, accuracy, uh, and, and, and precision, if you will. So then it depends what are, what are your circumstances. OK, thank you very much. I just, uh, make a comment on that. I think for me, um, the, the main advantage is that, uh, well, as you said, it's you know fast and it doesn't require a lot of, of sample, but mainly that it's done in solution. So you don't have you know always the same problem that you go into the gas phase and you don't know if your sub complexes that you see are, are, are real or if they are coming from dissociation in the gas phase. So I think it's very complementary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's certainly one thing for people working on mass spec. Um, it's also so we are not modifying the protein of, in any way. And what we see is really mass. It's not um, hydrodynamic radii or it doesn't depend on the shape of the particle. So if you have two different conformations of the same mass, you will see just one population. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question from uh, Lionel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the for the nice presentation. I have one question. Could there be any bias due to the shape of the the, the object you are looking to, um, especially with respect to the calibration? Let's say, for example, do you calibrate with globular proteins, and you measure uh, quite elongated protein? Mm -hmm. um, no, we see them. We see all the light that is scattered as coming from a single point. As long as the particles are smaller than 180 uh, nanometers. Because that's the diffraction limit of the optics. So if you have an elongated protein, let's say that is 100 nanometers, which is quite big for a protein, uh, or, a, um, or a globular conformation of the same protein, you will see the same amount of contrast. So with the, I think the biggest we've seen here is myosin, the elongated conformation of myosin and the closed uh, folded conformation of myosin, they both look the same and they, they were not distinguishable by mass photometry. So you will get the same mass. If you get longer than 180 nanometers, then yes, you will start having differences because you will you will see on the screen right away that the events are not round. The, the spots that we saw on the image are not circular anymore. They start to be elongated. Uh, but then and then the particles are not quantifiable anymore because the signal will be of a different nature. OK, thank you very much. So I think there is still COVID. Um, Pascal. Uh, yes, I'd uh, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, you said, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you said that you cannot observe uh, complexes that are molecules that are smaller than uh, forty kilo forty kilodalton. But what is the minimum shift in mass that you could uh, observe in, let's say, a half a megadalton protein? I guess it would depend on the on the width of the of the peak itself. But in your experience, uh, what mm -hmm. was uh, the minimum difference you could observe? Yeah. So yeah, of course it, it it will depend on the width of the peak. So it will depend on the nature of the sample. If you want to look at the the one that is on the screen right now, this is a very poly dispersed uh, protein. So you can see the peak has a median at about 600 kilodaltons, but it spans from 300 to 900, something like this, even one mega. So of course the shift here will need to be very big. If the sample is monodispersed, then as I think, let me show you. Yeah, these are the proper numbers. So if the sample is monodispersed, then this is the resolutions that we can um, see. Oh, where's my mouse here? I don't see it anymore. Yeah, this one's here. <laughs> Sorry. So um, for BSA, that's 66 kilodaltons. We see. So we are defining resolution as as full width at half maximum of the of the peak, and that is 25 kilodaltons. Whereas at 660, so 10 times bigger, it's 85 kilodaltons. And this could be equivalent to the the protein you saw before. So for a 
monodispersed protein at this mass, it's 85 kilodaltons, whereas for a very polydispersed protein, it can be a lot. Um, so basically, the bigger the complex, of course, the, the worse the resolution, but it's not exactly linear. So it, it really something that should be tested from protein to protein, but these are guiding numbers. Thank you. Um, I think, was there anything else? Pascal had something maybe? Yeah. I, kn I don't know, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a, a simple question. Uh, did you try to apply this technology on membrane protein? And membrane mm -hmm. protein inside the barleo? Yes, um, yes, it is possible. There are, of course, some extra limitations, uh, as always when talking about membrane proteins. But uh, yeah, I think, yeah, this is this one here. This is a nano disk as, as, as an example of a membrane mimetic, mimetic uh, system. A nano disk is something that works very well, for instance. So we can see the nano disk. We can see the nano disk alone and then the nano disk loaded with the protein. Uh, and we've had very much success with this type of samples. There is a paper, so I can send you that if that's interesting. There is a paper actually that it talks about mass photometry on membrane mimetic systems and it compares different, different ones. Now, when you talk, I guess, about detergents, which is probably the, the most, uh, common tool used and the one that produces the most, uh, limitations when working with membrane proteins, it is possible to use detergents in mass photometry. It comes with, uh, a little bit of a limitation extra, but it's possible. Basically, you will be affecting the limit of detection. So mm. the detergent will add noise. And then instead of seeing 40 kilodaltons as a limit, you might see 100 kilodaltons as a limit or 200 or 50. It really depends a lot on the type of detergent and on the um, nature of the concentration of that detergent. But let me see. I think, yeah, this is... This is, this is to give you an idea. So this is, we're trying to quantify the noise that the detergent gives. So the detergent will give a, a peak and it will seem like a, like a peak of a protein or something like this. It, there is a very clear way to differentiate it and call it noise, but basically anything within that range, it will not be visible. So you can see for, for some detergents, like this is, I don't know, digitonin is, is the first. You have the, the noise peak at, about 60, 80 kilodaltons for a few concentrations. Then when you reach CMC, it, it goes much higher because then we start seeing the micelles and, and they are too concentrated and that, that becomes a little bit crazy on the image. So if you go to these concentrations on the left, then you could see things that are probably bigger than 100 kilodaltons. But you can see this profile changes a lot depending on the detergent. It depends on the the nature of the molecule itself, the micelle size and the aggregation number and how it interacts with your protein and the buffer that you have. So it needs to be tested on a case by case basis. Uh, but, and then we have very good results by diluting the detergent right before the measurement. So mm -hmm. that there is a still a little bit of detergent, but much less. The noise is much more affordable and the protein is still stable in solution, at least for the time of the measurement. So it is possible it's a little bit more complicated and it requires some optimization. We have quite some experience on doing that. So if, if you were to have this instrument and wanted to do some cases that are a bit more challenging, we can always provide support to guide you through the experiment and give you a few tips on that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So you, you would do the experiment under the, the CNC, right? If I understood correctly. That is probably the best for most of the detergents, unless the micelle size is very small. Yes. And but it's, I would really recommend testing it on for each case. Yeah. It's very fast to test. You just need to do a, a blank measurement of the buffer alone and see what the noise is and maybe test a couple of concentrations. And did you try to cover, I mean, the, the glass plate with a really phospholipid bilayer? <laughs> Oh, with phospholipid, <laughs> yeah, that's a very interesting one. Um, 
we have not done it ourselves, but it has been done. There is a paper about that, a very recent one. Uh, oh, I can find it's not on the slides, but I can find that reference as well. Let me write that down. Um, so it is possible. It is not the most straightforward thing. And it's, it's not something that we developed and that we provide, let's say, a kit or something like that. It's something that you would need to test yourself. So it would require some optimization. But yeah, it's, it's been published. Yeah, thank you. I had a similar question, actually, uh, about uh, functionalizing the, the, the cover slip with, let's say, protein or <laughs> to look at the interaction. You know, Is this something that's been done as well? Or? Yes, um, it's something that you could do. Uh, the types of functionalization that we have established ourselves and that we have protocols to recommend, it's only one, and that is the one for um, negatively charged molecules, so mostly for nucleic acids. That works pretty well uh, in, the, in the state that it is right now. So you would say proteins, they would bind passively to the, to the glass without any treatment. Nucleic acids, they don't because of their high negative charge. So if you code, we, we do either polyelicin or aptes. That's positive. It will give positive charge to the glass. Then negative molecules, not only ne nucleic acids, we've seen negative polymers and things like that. Then they bind pretty well to the surface. It is possible you could imagine to do other types of coatings. It's, again, it's not something that we uh, have developed in-house or anything like that. It's certainly something that looks into the future of the technology because it, a lot of people are looking into that and are interested by that. And it's on our roadmap at one point, but um, uh, I don't recall. So I don't think there's anything really published about that yet. There is a, a couple of labs, at least, that I know that I'm aware of trying to do specific binding. So bind, functionalize the, the surface with an antibody or with some sort of biotin streptavidin system and then look for a specific binding but then yeah it would be something that you would need to develop on your own okay thank you um i've got another question actually about um sure <laughs> have you tried uh, to um to analyze some proteins after uh, cross-linking with uh, let's say formaldehyde or uh, or any other cross-linking and how do they mm -hmm. How do they look in terms of heterogeneity? Yes, we have seen something about that. Because um, that's something I, 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 with making mass spec, right? So because it's too heterogeneous. But I guess in your case, since the resolution is not very uh, good already, I mean, you can see maybe a broader peak, but... Uh, yeah, I think so. It is slightly broader. It depends a lot on the protocol. I think, I ha yeah, this, this one here is cross-linked, right? Yeah, yeah the, the bottom one is cross-linked. This is BSA. So it, it, uh -huh. it's, a, it's a rather simple system. Sure. But we know BSA, it's mostly monomeric, 66 clodaltons, and has some dimeric uh, molecules in normal conditions. You can even see a little bit of a trimer if you zoom in, but then when you cross link, you can, you can see an increase of the, of the oligomeric uh, parts. This is a particularly good case, I would say. So the protocol here was very much, um, optimized. Uh, the system is rather simple. So it's BSA is not big complexes. What I've seen in the field from, from customers that bring suddenly, um, um, cross linked sample that they were using for something else is, quite variable. So I would recommend you try different conditions or different times, different concentra concentrations of, of glutaraldehyde, et cetera, because it can get quite broad, the peak in some cases, that's true. But it's possible to get something, uh, something more like this. It will just need to require some, some testing. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any other question from the audience? Well, if not, uh, thank you again, Thomas. It was very interesting. And um, yeah, if you can share your slides uh, afterwards, uh, I'd be happy to, to mm -hmm. see anyone who's asking for, for them. And, uh, sure, no problem. I think I, I will share the slides with you. Uh, you can distribute that to everybody that was here. And I'll make a point to put all these this two reference about membrane, membrane proteins and lipids that I mentioned that are not on the slides as well. Right. 
Okay, well, thank you and um, goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Sure. Thanks everybody for coming. And uh, I think there is my email as well on the on the slides. So if you have a further question uh, about it or something like that, just feel free to to reach out. We're always available to discuss potential applications or or potential tests or or things like that. Okay. Perfect. We'll be in touch. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Bye bye everybody.